Kelly Carroll is Director of Ad Advocacy and Community Outreach at Historic District Council, where she serves as the primary liaison to a network of over 500 local activist groups and facilitates both local and citywide preservation campaigns. She is also a former resident of Morningside Heights. Uh, prior to joining Historic Districts Council, Kelly served as Director of Preservation for Landmark West. She holds a Master of Science in Historic Preservation from Columbia University. Thank you, Kelly, for giving us your time this evening and sharing your perspectives. Kelly? Thank you. My name is Kelly Carroll. And yes, I lived in Morningside Heights when I was a student at Columbia University. And um, West 112th Street, now that little corner of it, is now in the Morningside Heights Historic District. It was not when I lived there, so I'm very pleased about that. So quickly, um, Gregory Dietrich uh, is on my board of advisors and has a lot to talk about tonight. So I'll be very brief. And um, I'm already seeing some questions in the chat about some of the things I'm going to cover. So I'll, I would like to remind everyone that we're going to be taking questions <clears throat> at the end of the evening after Gregory's presentation as well. So. The Historic Districts Council is the citywide advocate for New York's historic neighborhoods, and um, we work in all five boroughs. We're really the only preservation organization of its kind in New York in that we do direct advocacy with local neighborhood groups, such as the Morningside Heights Historic District Committee. Um, and our mission is protecting the integrity of the New York City Landmarks Law and furthering the preservation ethic. So that can mean everything from uh, national register nominations, to creating block associations, to creating actual historic districts. Uh, we work in three main areas, which is community outreach, which is my specialty, education. We have uh, lectures, walking tours, which are now virtual, um, and advocacy, which is where we're also the only group that reviews every uh, proposal to every landmark building in every borough almost every week, and we give testimony to the Landmarks Preservation Commission about the appropriateness of those interventions. And as Robert had mentioned, we have over 500 neighborhood partners citywide. So one of the highlights of the work that we do is something called the Six to Celebrate program. And the Six to Celebrate program is where a community or neighborhood will self-nominate uh, to our organization uh, every year. And we choose six based on their need, based on um, geographic diversity, based on merit. And Morningside Heights was our six to celebrate community in 2015. And what this program really does is it gives focused advocacy towards these specific areas. So in the case of Morningside Heights, this meant extra press attention, um, extra walking tours, we do print material that highlights the neighborhoods. Um, just, just being announced as the Six to Celebrate neighborhood in itself really elevates um, the face of an area and puts it into the public consciousness. For instance, sometimes our Six to Celebrate groups will get published in AM New York. So somebody riding the subway to work that morning will, will see maybe a neighborhood they've never heard of before. So after our, um, uh, some hard work, in 2015 and the many years worth of, of hard work from the community itself, Morningside Heights was designated as a historic district in 2017 and Gregory uh, will talk more about expanding this. Um, but as you can see, the district currently um, focused mostly west of Broadway and it was a substantially sized district, but we are hoping for more. And that's why we're going to learn a little bit tonight why historic districts 
matter, why we have them in New York to begin with, and why what they can do for your neighborhood and what they can do for your community and what they can do for you as an owner. So for those of you who may not know anything about landmarks, we can just start at ground zero here. So any, many of you may not even know that the viaduct that begins at 122nd Street and goes all the way to 135, that is a landmark. Um, and the, the, the criteria for being a landmark in our city is quite broad and I have it here on the screen. Um, we only have a 30 year rule of most municipalities and, and including the federal government require 50. So it allows for a uh, great latitude in determining and for people to submit what they feel is important, um, which can be historical, aesthetically, architecturally or culturally and as part of the city, state, or nation. So it doesn't even necessarily have to be something that's very special to New York City. It could be part of our country's history or vice versa. And it's not a landmark until it has been designated by the Landmarks Preservation Commission. There are national register historic districts and landmarks, but they are not New York City landmarks unless they have been designated by our city's agency, which for short we call the LPC. So let's say that this is something that people think is a good idea and they wanna start pursuing um, on individual block levels and following the lead of the Morningside Heights Historic District Committee. The process for this looks very simple on this screen, but in fact, most of the work takes place on the ground in meetings like the one we're having tonight in talking with your neighbors. All of that is not accounted for on the screen, but if you were to count back negative from one and probably go to at least 50, you know, all of these this work behind closed doors and and um, by word of mouth is really important. But let's say all that work gets done and I'm, I feel that it will again. And the commission says that it's going to landmark a building or landmark a district. The first step in that is to put the district or building on the commission's calendar. Um, after it's on the calendar, that means that it's pretty, it's on wheels and it's going to happen. Uh, the city is very careful about what they allocate resources to. So if you get a resource on the calendar, it's, it's gonna become a landmark. You can be pretty 99% sure. Um, after, and by the way, this is all a very, very public process. Um, the landmarks, landmarks do not get designated in the middle of the night. Um, there, is, there are so many steps of outreach with the city itself. There's certified mailing. Um, there's, this goes through the community board. So no one will be left in the dark. Um, and then that brings me to, there is a public hearing at the Landmarks Commission itself where you can testify. Um, and then after a hearing, there's a vote. And once the commission votes in the room that day or in the Zoom room these days, uh, the building or resource or district becomes protected at that moment, even though it has not yet moved through um, the city planning commission, um, the city council or the mayor, but those are steps that it will eventually have to move through. So this is um, a very abridged version of a very complicated process, but for the interest of time, we will move on. So our law was created in 1965 under Mayor Wagner. There he is signing it. Um, and in 1972, it was expanded to include um, in interiors and parks. And I would like to point out that we have, New York City has the strongest landmarks law in the country. So there's different kinds of landmarks, but they all have the, the same protection. So individual landmarks currently, um, we have almost 1,500 of them. And Morningside Heights is home to uh, several individual landmarks. And I put a couple on the screen here that you all are likely familiar with and have walked by many times. And currently, the area only has one historic district, but we're hoping for more, and that's what Gregory will speak all about. But currently, we are um, we just hit 150 in 2020, and that was uh, the first one ever designated remotely, and that was in uh, East Flatbush, who, like Morningside Heights, just got its first historic district last year. So there's also interior landmarks. They're quite rare, 
But Morningside Heights actually has a handful of them, uh, including the Columbia University subway stop and the Lowe Memorial Library interior. Um, Grant's tomb is an interior landmark, which is very interesting. And then there are also scenic landmarks um, under the landmarks law and Morningside Heights uh, excuse me, uh, Morningside Park is one of those scenic landmarks and as is Riverside Park. So this neighborhood is incredibly unique in the fact that it has every kind of landmark you can have uh, under our city's law. So while that seems like a lot um, and 37,000 certainly is a lot, it actually accounts for less than 4% of all of the properties in New York City. I believe that the number right now is around 3.7% of all properties. So um, there is often a lot of talk about how everything is getting landmarked, but really big picture, it's less than 4% of our city's um, tax loss. So why, let's say you're in this meeting and you're like, who cares? Like, why should we even designate landmarks why do they matter? Well, I would have to ask you then why you would choose to live in a place like New York City, which is one of the most culturally, architecturally, and historically significant places on planet Earth, okay? And the law and protecting these places is the embodiment of preserving our culture as a city and who we are. And I have these examples on the screen because this really runs the gamut of what we value as a city, whether it being a modest altered home of abolitionists in downtown Brooklyn that was recently saved, whether it's the theaters that we go to, which by the way, the Apollo is also an interior landmark, or it can be a monument that is recognized on a global scale, like, like Lady Liberty. So all of these things, even though they're incredibly different from one another, they all have the same level of protection under our city's law. And it gives us a sense of place. Um, new, nobody would come to New York if it was just a bunch of Walmarts and 7-Elevens everywhere, right? So just like, why do people go to Cinque Terre in Italy? Why do people go to uh, Puerto Rico? Because it looks like Puerto Rico. It looks like Italy. So Morningside Heights looks like Morningside Heights. If we don't preserve the way these places look, then they could be anywhere, right? Also, landmarks are anchors of perpetuity in a world of constant change. We're not saying to landmark everything, but when you have these sites that are distinctly a place that is, un, is recognizable only as that place, it really matters. And we're a young country, but one day, you know, we're gonna have these monuments, hopefully, that will stand the test of time because we, we acted now to protect them and they will have the notoriety that some of these places abroad do. And I just wanted to put the actual landmarks law on the screen. Um, the law itself was really, it's very simple. The, the goals, the aims of it, um, the, the aims are not to, to stop uh, development or to freeze things in amber, it's to foster civic pride, to enhance our tourism, to stabilize and improve our property values, to protect our heritage, to strengthen the economy, and to pro promote public education. And I just want to say quickly that, you know, no one ever has an argument about why, why should we have a park, right? Why do we have parks? Parks are, who needs a park? Just like how we have parks, because we know that they're good for us. They're good for the public. They're good for us in cities. They're good for, for pets. They're good for relaxation. They're good for mental health. The, the same concept is behind our city's landmarks law in terms of what's good for us. We're allowed to live in beautiful places. We're allowed to have beautiful architecture that contributes to our city and our culture. We're allowed to have these nice things. So if you're having trouble wrapping your brain about why landmarks matters, try to translate that to, well, what if we didn't have parks? Because the value really is inherently the same. It's just different. So why else should we designate landmarks? So this is, this is hitting a little close to home, or not a little, a lot. So when you have a historic district, um, demolition is not as of right. So that's the, that is a big drawback. If you're a property owner who wants to demolish your building and develop it, I will say that right now. But if you're in a historic district, you still could have a property potentially torn down. I've seen a lot of crazy things in my day and re very recently. But what it will be replaced with 
will probably not look like this because it will have the input from the public and the commission itself to ensure that if something is going to be replaced, it's going to look more contextual. In a historic district, the infill building will have to respond to the environment in a way that the city deems appropriate. It's not going to have a discordant relationship either in height, scale, or materials or massing, the way that this has sprouted up on um, West 120th Street. Um, similarly, we now have a missing tooth on Claremont Avenue. The photograph on the left, and anyone who knows the area, if you walk this streetscape, it's very harmonious in terms of scale, feel, uh, materials palette, which includes color, which includes texture. Um, all of these things are co contributions to what we call a sense of place. And unfortunately, because of the lack of historic district um, designation, as I said, all of these buildings can be torn down as of right that are not landmarked. So while a portion of Union Theological Cemetery, Seminary is, not all of its real estate holdings are. And this is what can happen. So this is what is going to be replacing that little tooth, okay, which is not a big lot, but this massive 42-story Robert A.M. Stern skyscraper will be shoehorned um, onto, onto Claremont Avenue. And I just want to say that this is going to have a profound impact uh, on the skyline of Morningside Heights, which right now, as everyone knows, is really dominated by this incredible uh, gothic termination of Riverside Church, um, which will now um, be second fiddle to this large tower. Uh, Gregory Dietrich is going to speak about this, but um, this is currently under threat. This is, uh, and this is a very large building if, in terms of density. So uh, McGifford Hall um, is, it could be very much on the chopping block, and we'll let, we'll let Gregory speak about that. So I'm, I'm using this all of these as an example because you have to understand that all of these losses while individual there's one here there's one there there's the row houses that were demolished on 113th street there were the condos that were built within the cathedrals close at saint john to the divine all of these little things um will erode the overall character of a neighborhood and which which is why we are acting tonight to really try to put this um, this issue into the mind and into the public consciousness because if this keeps happening Morningside Heights will stop looking less and less like home. So quickly um, landmarking will regulate all the exterior changes to landmarked buildings or sites and by the way if you're a building in a historic district you're also called a landmark. There's no difference between St. John the Divine, which is an individual landmark, or if you happen to be an apartment building in the Morningside Heights Historic District. They're both called landmarks and they both have the same level of protection. Um, I, I did mention this, it will discourage demolition. It won't require you to restore your house to how it looked in 1940 tax photograph or in one of these wonderful historic images, but you do have to take care of your property. Um, as I mentioned, you do have to, it does, um, the community is encouraged to participate. And I want to say that um, landmarking, unfortunately, will not save your favorite business or your favorite bar or your favorite bookstore um, because only zoning controls use. And it, it also can't afford, uh, preserve affordable housing because that is also use. Um, this is my last slide, so I would like to end on a good note. So there are there are financial benefits to being a landmark. Um, the first the first point is let's say that we get a, an extension of a district uh, in any of those blocks, um, then you can work directly with the state, which which will be a whole other 101 if people are interested. Um, and you can get homeowner tax credits um, up to 40 percent which is a huge financial um, advantage. Um, there's also a historic preservation grant program, which is administered from the city itself in partnership with HPD. Uh, they just uh, awarded a lot of money last month to projects in need, including in, in individual property owners' homes. Um, and then there, there is also a very, very low interest loan program available through our colleagues at the Landmarks Conservancy. So, 
I'm going to stop here and I want to encourage all of you to email me. Thank you so much. Great. Kelly, thank you so much uh, for your insights and in, on the importance of historic designation and the whole process for achieving our phase two preservation goals.